it's me again, Ray, G4 and SJ, the continuing story of Peyton Place. Welcome to video number seven. I'm going to put them all together at some stage, so if you want a, a sort of three hour binge on the HRO, you can do that. A uh, little bit of progress so far. Um, right, I shall take my jacket off and we'll get stuck in. I want to start with uh, a bit of a revelation, well to me anyway, the US Navy, different coil packs, different IF frequencies. I've put all this on the website, which is uh, g4nsj.co.uk. Go there and you'll see main menu, go down to communications receivers and the HRO is there. Now, the US Navy wanted these, okay, for their ships. One key requirement from the US Navy was for the receiver to cover frequencies between 400 and 500 kilohertz, a range that the standard HRO could not access due to its intermediate frequency, the IF of 456 kilohertz, as mine is, okay? To address this, I'm reading this from an article, the IF frequency was adjusted to 175 kilohertz, allowing the receiver to cover a broader frequency range from approximately 200 kcs, sorry, kilohertz, to 30 megs. Now, <clears throat> the Navy also specified that the receiver came equipped with seven coil packs, which were not interchangeable with those of the standard HRO, as mine, okay, the 456 kilohertz receivers. These coils were distinguishable, that's a good word, distinguishable, identifiable, <laughs> by two metal plates on the front which engage with the locking system, as well as unique stampings on the coil insulators. So basically, where's my other one? Oh, it's here. It's in the radio. Hang on. You see, did I show you this before? You see these little plates here? It's there and there they i think i mentioned this in my last video but i've now had confirmation of it when you push that in there are two little things on the front that can lock that in so you can't pull this out the idea presumably was when you're on a, a navy ship out at sea this wouldn't fall out i don't think it would anyway but this is interesting because i've, I've mentioned this 175 kilohertz IF to people before and they've said oh no no I'm not aware of that a lot of people have said no 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 that's not right it is right <laughs> it says so on my iPad so it must be right no seriously I got this from from one source basically the trouble is with the internet there's all this information everywhere a lot of it is contradictory so you don't know what to believe uh, same as watching the news really on television <laughs> you don't know what to believe but I have been studying this. I've been to various places all over the internet trying to, what's the word, correlate, is it? Put together all this info, not only in videos, but on my website as well. As I say, g4nsj.co.uk. Now, this coil pack then is not compatible with this receiver. 456 kilohertz IF, naval type coil pack that wants 175 kilohertz IF. That is why to get this, I wanted this to cover, what is it? It was um, 900 KCs or something to 2.05 megs. It didn't cover that. It covered most of it, but it was all wrong. I wanted it to cover up to 2.05 megs to include top band, the 160 meter amateur band, 1.8 to 2 megs. I don't know what it is in your country, wherever you are but that's what it is here, 1.8 to 2 megs. I've had to twiddle the oscillator to its full extent. It won't go any further. And I've got it up to 2 point, what was it? 2.02 megs. And I think it starts at 840 kilohertz. So I've now got most of the medium wave band on here. I've got the other half of medium wave on my other coil pack. And I've got top band up to 2.02 megs. I think I've got it. It's all tuned up nicely, but it is at the end of its travel. So if you've got a coil pack with those two little plates either side, then that is a US Navy type coil pack. And it is compatible with this if you do a lot of twiddling. 
So that's interesting. I just thought I'd mention that before I go any further. Do you remember in the last, was it the last video, whenever it was, the crystal rattled and I took it apart. The little quartz crystal itself between the two brass plates was rattling about. And I thought well, that's obviously no good. So what I did, I adjusted the brass plates and either side, like spacers, were strips of ground glass. It all seemed rather odd, so I took the ground glass out and made sure the plates were against the crystal. Now the crystal filter didn't work uh, beforehand and it didn't work afterwards, so I thought, oh well, never mind, at least I've sorted out the crystal because it rattled. <laughs> I have now read an article and it says the ground glass spacers are to keep the crystal away from the brass plates, give it an air gap of 0 0.002 inches. Didn't have millimetres back then. Well, they did, but we didn't use them here in the UK or uh, America because you still use inches, don't you, and stuff. So what I've did, I've put the two strips of glass back, the spacers, and it now rattles again. And I'll just give you a demonstration. This is... Um, and, uh... Right, that's normal, quite wide. If I switch the crystal filter in, hear that? I've probably got that a bit too tight. That's working beautifully. Take the crystal filter out. And it's wide. Can anyone tell me how that works? Two brass plates, the piece of quartz flopping about in between them. Is it somehow capacity coupled? Is that what's happening? I've never known anything like it. Back in the 60s, I remember the old, what were they called, the old Baker-like crystal holders with the two pins. Used to take those apart. And do you remember, I don't know what you had in other countries, but here we had Ajax and Vim. It was like a, a scouring powder. And I remember spending hours, a bit of rag, doing that on the quartz crystal, you know, to change its frequency. I won't tell you what frequency I was on and where I wanted it to go, a little bit higher or whatever it was, because uh, that's another story. Back then, when I reassembled the crystal, it was firmly between the two contacts. Why is this one rattling about? Anyone tell me, ray at g4nsj.co.uk. Be great to hear from you with an explanation, because I haven't got a clue. The coil pack I bought online was meant to be, what was it, 3.5 to 7.3 megs. So I thought that's good, that gives me 80 metres, the 5 meg frequencies and the 40 metre amateur band. Well, someone had been at this with a screwdriver. Some massive thing like this and oh, let's twist this, graunch, graunch and it's all, there's a photo there, you can see that screw head. It's graunched, they all are. I don't know why people do it. Also, the, these aluminium cans are all dented and scratched. Doesn't matter because everything inside is all right. Anyway, I managed to check the frequency that it covered. I put it in the receiver and it was covering something weird. I bought this as working, tested and working. Well, it did sort of work, I suppose, to an extent. Somehow I just screwed all these, including the oscillator. It was all over the place. I managed with the help of my Nano VNA using that as a signal generator. I managed to get it now 3.4 to 7.6 megs and it works well it works really well but why do people do this why do they graunch things well why do they twiddle things in the first place it probably didn't need adjusting but someone I suspect someone thought I'll tell you what I'm just gonna oh, can I get this any louder can I get the S meter up a bit higher graunch graunch oh no I've ruined it <laughs> I don't know why people do it they should leave things alone take up fishing instead I've now got what I wanted is up to 7.6 megs because that gives me the is it the 41 meter broadcast band and i've got this six meg broadcast band 
the five meg one there's one around five isn't there um so that's good i like the broadcast bands something else i did while i was setting that up i had a go on ssb 40 meters tuned into an ssb station and this resolves ssb beautifully i was quite taken aback there we are stunned even uh there's still a funny thing with this switch here that's the agc switch i put in last time that's all that does agc off and on this one here as i said in a previous video it's a double pole double throw so half of it switches the oscillator on and off the other half where the center contact goes that way or that way all right i'm not sure what that does i still haven't traced the wiring i'm going to do that in a minute but when I switch the oscillator on, the BFO, resolves uh, SSB beautifully. And CW is fantastic, especially with the filter. It's working lovely. But this, I don't know what the other side of the switch does. It cuts the audio gain right down and it's humming. I don't know what's going on there. So that's something still to be sorted out. I've fitted the new RF gain control, thanks to Chuck. For that thank you chuck for sending me that all the way from america wire wound 10k two watt that's in there beautifully i've still got that hole there in the front panel i'm uh, not sure i think someone's made that that shouldn't be there not too sure the noise limiter i fitted the new double diode valve that is the pot for it and at the moment it's still bypassed so i'm going to unbypass it then find out why the noise limiter isn't working. It's a pretty simple circuit. Basically, it's the double diode valve and what the diodes do, you get, take ignition interference. Do you remember that from the old days back in the 60s? You get spikes, like, like a row of spikes. And what the limiter does, it cuts them off. As you adjust the pot to a greater or lesser extent, it cuts those spikes off. So you can hear, because those spikes will be above Normally, if they're light, loud and strong, they'd be above the audio level. So that, that's it. There's only two diodes and a handful of components, so there can't be much wrong with it. I've not looked into it yet because I was more interested in getting all the rest of the receiver working properly. Very pleased with the filter there, the crystal filter. In this next clip, I'm just having a tune around on the 40 meter amateur band. Have a look at this. That's the BFO switch now on the front. I know it's not supposed to be there and the other switch lower down I've left in situ. Um, I just wanted to be able to use the BFO without this loss of audio gain on this other switch here. I still haven't followed the wiring to that, but I will get round to it. Uh, there was a blank hole there, as you know. Okay, it's not meant to be the CW oscillator switch there, but uh, it works and it could always be removed, of course. So, as you heard on 40 metres there, it's very lively. Yeah, that's working well. I'm pleased with that. I'll end it here. I don't want to make each video too long. Um, as I say, I might eventually put them all together. So what is still to do? The S-meter zeroing pot there isn't working. The S-meter doesn't read a lot. The noise limiter isn't working yet. Crystal filters working. Good on sideband. Coil packs tuned up. We're getting there slowly. I, <laughs> I shall see you in part eight. Part eight. How long is this going to go on for? Who was it said? I'm looking forward to part 137 in 2030. <laughs> Whatever, in years time. Stone the crows. There probably will be part 137 at this rate. See you in part eight. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.